Thank you, Kirsten. We have a recording running. So, TSEAS, so the Technical Subcommittee on Encoded Archivist Standards at the Society of American Archivists, Q, uh, TSEAS at SAA, much quicker. Uh, you have a background presentation regarding what we are available in, a pre in the presentation and also present on YouTube. You will have access to all the links and afterwards, so please take a look at that one. It's a couple of years old, but we still do the same thing. So on the next slide, uh, this is all the places where we are, where you can find us. So we have a web page, we are on GitHub, we have a publication on the Library of Congress, we also have EIC published on the Stash Bibliothek in Berlin, we have a mailing list and even if it's named EID, it's for all EIS things. And we have a form for uh, reporting issues. But all this will be touched by in today's presentation. So one more slide for me. Uh, so when it comes to standards revision, we are following uh, a schedule where we have smaller, minor releases every year following a rolling revision cycle that is described on uh, GitHub. But we also need to do every five years following the SAA Standards Committee regulations, do a major revision and look into things. And that is where we ended up. So I would try to keep quiet and keep a lookout for people. And Kirsten, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Karin, for this introduction. And welcome again, everyone, to today's session. Before we go into the details of the call for comments, I just wanted to uh, touch on two points with regard to the major revision of EAD in itself. Um, the first one is the overall timeline. Um, so um, as you can see here, uh, we are currently in the year where we will concentrate on reviewing the feedback that we get from the community as part of the call for commons activities. Um, three years ago, we started out with uh, this revision and we took the first year to get a better understanding of the status quo, um, specifically with regard to the fact that we know that both predecessor versions of EAD, so EAD 3, but also EAD 2002 are still widely used throughout the community in their different variations. Um, so we had a few engagement activities around that, um, had a panel with different use cases from EAD 3 um, applications. We had a survey, we had some engagement sectors sessions specifically with uh, certain parts of the community. So looking at people who are only starting out to learn about EAD, uh, people who are look, um, the so-called loan arrangers um, and trying to kind of cover different um, parts of the community and their requirements. In 2022, we then went on and concentrated specifically on aligning ED with ECCPF, which uh, back in August 2022 was released in its current version 2.0. Um, and in this context, we also looked at the standards for functions that TSES is currently preparing. And then in the last year, we kind of moved on to specifically looking at uh, aspects that are kind of concerning EAD in itself. Uh, so um, any elements that are specific to EAD and don't appear in the other standards. Um, so that kind of led us then to coming to the draft version of EAD4, which we published last week. Speaking of EAD4, uh, I wanted to just mention at the very high level, the benefits of the new version as we see it here at TSES. Um, and I hope that once you have had the time to engage with the draft version, you will agree, uh, if not with all, then at least with most of them. Um, and one thing that I wanted to emphasize at the beginning is that we are not developing these standards in the ivory tower all by ourselves. 
but we are developing this um, for cultural heritage professionals around the world and with cultural heritage professionals around the world. So this does not only look at TSES in itself, which is an international committee, and we have really um, members at the moment from all continents that we have around the world, but it's also looking at a session like today's, where we are trying to engage with the community as much as possible and get your feedback so that we can include that into our vision process. In terms of the new version itself, we have broken the benefits down into four main areas. And the first one is ED4 being interoperable. I already mentioned the alignment with ECCPF. Uh, so in the new version, we essentially have half of the elements in EAD being shared elements with ECCPF, which hopefully will make it easier to use both standards next to each other and to maybe exchange information from one standard to the other more easily than that was the case previously. Um, but it also refers to more interoperability with other standards that people might use next to EAD. So we know that from the US context, there's often a parallel use with Mark 21, but there might also be use cases where EAD is used next to something like, for example, premise or another standard that is coming from a related cultural heritage domain. The second point is that we want to make ED more sustainable, more future-proof. Um, and that is looking at things like records and contexts. So the newest version of the descriptive uh, model and conceptual model that was published by the ICA end of last year. Um, but it also looks into things like more support for linked data and more support for linking between descriptive elements within the same EAD instance, which we have extended uh, significantly compared to the previous versions. Speaking about linked data, um, we have uh, essentially kind of allowed the possibility to refer to vocabularies, thesauri, uh, or other types of authority files to about 50 elements within the new version of EAD, where previously this was very much concentrating on the elements that are part of the controlled access area. So this kind of is extended and hopefully will also make it easier for EAD users to connect to those existing resources. We are also removing the label experimental from the whole relations um, element and section. So we are including relations more actively in existing elements uh, and therefore also hopefully making uh, it more prominent in terms of the use and therefore allowing ED to get closer to um, RDF and semantic web standards. And the last point is um, ED4 is extensible. So while we have all these new possibilities, we still see ED4 as something that you can very easily use just with simple text input. So you can use the text input, you can extend that by including the links to the vocabularies. And if you wanted to, you can extend that even further by being very specific and very explicit about the relationships with these external resources um, that you want to describe. Um, and that also, um, in, on the other hand, means that we are looking at different ways to uh, enable formatting in all of that. So um, looking at elements like tables and lists, um, and also with regard to how we do mixed content in the new version of EAD. This is as far as we wanted to go with today's session in terms of what ED4 is about, um, because we wanted to use this session as more of an introduction into the call for comments and how you can contribute. And before we go into these details, I wanted to mention two pages, which will be the main hubs, so to say, throughout the call for comments phase, where you can find all the information that you need. 
Um, the first one is our web page on the SAA's website. Uh, and you have a short introduction text uh, there in terms of the call for comments. And then you will also find um, documents that either had been uploaded directly to the SAA website or are linked from there so that you have everything in one place. And the same you will find when you are on GitHub. Um, there is one dedicated page, place where we are gathering all those documents and links uh, also in this context so that it's easy for everyone to find their entry point into the new version. All these links are in the slide deck and we will share the slide deck afterwards, same as we will share the recording. So you will have all of that available. There already is quite a lot that we have included in this first iteration of the call for comments. Um, and believe us, we know that it is a lot, but it is also uh, in our eyes necessary to have different ways to represent what we have done throughout the last three years. And there's even more to come. So at the moment, we don't have a tag library. We'll be working on this and hopefully be able to provide you with a draft version of this throughout the next few weeks. Uh, there might be new chapters to the best practices guide, specifically introducing any elements that we are suggesting to include as new elements in ED4. And we might be able to provide you with more example files so that you can see how existing ED files might look in ED4 transformed, so to say. The reason why we are offering these different types of information or different versions of the same information is that we are convinced that um, in the breadth of the community, different people will need different things. So we might have the developer who is jumping directly onto the schema, uh, but we also might have uh, colleagues in the community who are more on the descriptive side of things and might kind of prefer information being presented more in a textual or documentary format. And between these two extremes, there also is a difference in level of detail. So we have documentation in there that starts really high level and gives you the general idea of the different concepts that are represented in the new version. But you can also, if you wanted to, dig deeper and go into all the details as necessary. In short, to start out, what we would kind of recommend is start at a level that you feel most comfortable with. If that is general, go for the general documents. If that is very detailed or if there is a need for you to get all the details right away, you can also do that or you might kind of find yourself somewhere in between. It might also be the case that you're saying, I'd rather want to wait until the tech library is there because that is a format that I'm used to in terms of engaging with a standard um, and might just kind of take, take a step back right now and wait until the tech library is available. And just to remember, um, not every type of the documentation will work in the same way for everyone. And we also don't necessarily expect everybody to engage with every piece of documentation that we provide. As mentioned, they are kind of complementing each other and um, giving different ways to entry the new version, but it's not necessary to kind of read every single piece of it. Yeah. From the documentation that we currently have, I just wanted to talk you through what we think is the use case for each of them. And then you can hopefully make your decision in terms of where you want to start in your own context. Um, so this is the list of things that is currently available, and I will talk you through each of them in the next few slides. Starting with the descriptive notes block. Um, here we are collaborating with the colleagues from SAA's description section, um, and we are planning a series of five posts in total. Two have already been published. Uh, the first one very generally looking at why do we do a revision and how does that work? Um, and the second one looking specifically at the alignment between EAD and ECCPF. And there will be three more in the next few months. These blocks 
introduce very generally the lines of the revision process and the new version. So they are starting from the perspective of archival description. They might include some more details in terms of the encoded archival description, but they still kind of keep things light and stay at a higher level. Nonetheless, there are links in there that allow you to dig deeper if you are interested. So that might be a good starting point for anyone who wants to just get a general understanding of what is going on and what they can expect from the new version. The second document is what we call the editorial. And that is essentially a textual description of the main aspects of the new version. So this is really looking at ED4 and it is looking at the different parts of it and describing what it includes, uh, the possibility that you have with it. Um, it might include some notes in terms of the drivers behind the concepts representing in ED4 and how that might differ from previous version, but it doesn't go into the details in terms of the difference between ED4 and, for example, ED3. This again kind of provides you with an overview and um, you can, for example, use the table of contents to navigate to any of the subchapters represented in this editorial that interest you. Um, so you don't have to read through the whole document, but you can essentially kind of start at any point um, that is of specific interest. Here's just one example uh, in terms of the chapter where it, we talk about encoding places and place names, uh, just to kind of talk you through what to expect from that editorial. Um, Usually the ch these chapters concentrate on either a specific element or on a group of element, like in this case. So you will find the main elements um, introduced um, with specific information about maybe sub elements or attributes that you can use with them um, and some more descriptive background in terms of what type of information we would expect to be encoded within them. You will also find links to relevant GitHub issues where you can find all the details if wanted. And you will find links to other chapters within the editorial. So when you start out with one chapter and find a link to another chapter that is of interest, you can essentially kind of from there start your journey and browse through the document. The next document is the revision notes. And this is essentially the document where we look more specifically at the changes compared to ED3 in the deprecated version. Um, so this really gives you all the details of the revision. Um, we will be looking at creating the similar thing uh, for ED2002. At the moment, we have concentrated on the direct comparison between the current version and the potential new version. Um, the revision notes explain in more detail what has changed. Uh, so they give you lists of elements and attributes affected by a specific change. Um, they might be grouping type of changes. Um, and um, apart from these grouping aspects, they also follow the structure of an EED instance for element specific changes. So that might also be a nice entry point for anyone who's already using EAD and can easily find, for example, anything that relates to sub elements of the DIT element in EAD3. Again, you have a table of contents that essentially allows you to jump in at any point of the revision notes. You don't have to read through the document uh, step by step. And as an example, um, this is just a chapter around what I mentioned earlier with regard to the possibility to reference external vocabularies, thesauri, or authority files. And similar to the editorial, um, these chapters will start with a brief mention of the elements or attributes in question. Um, they will explain whether these elements or attributes already existed in ED3, if they have been renamed, why they have been renamed, um, if they have been kind of integrated with other elements that already have existed, and how that will work in the new version. And then usually you will have a list um, of all the elements that are affected by that change so that you can 
easily find the information in terms of um, what you might want to look at. The next part is probably the most technical part at the moment. Uh, so that is the EAD for draft schema, which is a technical expression of the new version of EAD. And this is available in three file formats. Uh, we have, as we had with EAD3, the XSD and the RNG version. The RNG version is wrapped into the zip and the tar GZ packages that you can download from GitHub. Um, and then we have a new format, which is the NVDL format. Um, and that is specifically to combine ED4 and XHTML validation. Uh, XHTML is what we are looking to introduce in terms of taking care of all the formatting options that you might have in the longer descriptive elements. There also is a first version of the Schematron available for more specific validation, for example, in terms of normalized states or in terms of language codes. Um, so you can essentially kind of here have the package for a more technical check on the new version. You can either download the preferred schema or you can get the GitHub URL um, for whichever version of the schema you want to use following those um, files that you see here. And there are essentially kind of two main options as we see it to engage with the schema directly. Uh, the first one is something for hand coders or hands-on reviewers. So if you learn best by actually doing things, then this might be an option for you. Um, and the suggestion essentially is that you take an existing ED file, and that can be ED3 or ED2002, depending on what you're using. Uh, open that in your XML editor and associate it with the ED4 schema. Um, and I've included on this slide uh, essentially kind of the snippet of the root element ED uh, in terms of what you would need to change. Uh, so it is the namespace um, and it's the schema location that would need to be updated. If you want to do it, my suggestion would be to start with a shorter file first and then extend that to a longer file uh, in the next step if wanted, uh, because depending on how long the file is and how much repetition you have, um, you might have kind of quite a way uh, to go through different things that might then show up when you do that. Because associating the file with the new version of the schema your XML editor will usually start showing you those elements and attributes in your files that do not confirm to that new schema. So it will also ideally show you what might need to be changed, as you can see here in this example, where the attribute related encoding is highlighted as not being available anymore in the element EED. And essentially with this, you can step-by-step step work your way through your file and update it in order to get to a valid EAD4 file. The recommendation in this context would be that in any updates that you do in order to get to your valid file, you include an XML comment of the change that you've done, which hopefully then will also help you to better understand um, the extent of changes that you might need to do in your context. Um, that being said, similar to the ED3 revision, we are also planning to provide an official transformation towards ED4. Um, so usually all these things that we find in, in kind of exercises like this, uh, we will put into the transformation script so that things that can be automatized and can be generalized uh, will be taken care of already with this script. The second version is probably the one for the more technically worst colleagues among the community. Uh, and that is essentially just kind of looking at the schema itself and comparing it directly with the schema for EAD3 or EAD2002. So just searching for an element uh, of interest and really kind of looking at the detail of how that is defined in the schema 
I've here used the example of the element unit ID, uh, which you can see on the left as it is defined in ED4, and on the right as it is currently defined in ED2002. The schema, um, if you are not kind of uh, that technically um, declined, um, you might also want to kind of use the following two documents, which kind of give you a similar information as these schema exercises will give you. The first one is the so-called transformation rules table. And that essentially kind of gives you a very detailed overview of how a specific element would need to be changed in order to move from ED3 deprecated version to ED4. So this lists all existing ED3 elements in alphabetical order. So you can easily find um, the element that you might be interested in and it names their EAD4 equivalents. Um, and that might be that the name stays the same. It might be that the name includes a camel casing as is the case for the example of convention declaration that you can see on this slide. Um, it might be that the element has been completely renamed or integrated with other elements. Um, and then it gives you a detailed information about the transformation of the element and its content and sub-elements, as well as the attributes that you might have used with the element. So essentially you can use that table to kind of look into these changes that you would need to apply. So kind of similar to what you would have gotten from the exercise number one uh, with the schema. The second table is the changes in the schema table, and that essentially kind of is the equivalent to option two when working with the schema, because this shows you a detailed overview of how the definition of a specific element changes in ED4 compared to ED3. The difference between both of these is that this changes in the schema table will also, for example, include the addition of optional sub-elements or optional attributes, which you have to have defined in the schema, but, but which might not play that much of a role if you're looking at transforming ED3 to ED4. This table also lists all new ED4 elements, uh, but on the other hand, it only mentions any elements that uh, will not be part of ED4 anymore because they have been replaced by, by others. Um, so you might need to use both of these tables next to each other. In addition, this table also includes links to relevant GitHub issues that document the schema changes. And it gives you a little bit of a possibility to see some statistics. So for example, if you're interested in which elements share a specific attribute group, you can easily find that in this table. Uh, or if you want to know which elements uh, share a specific content model, uh, you can also find that in this table. And here's just an example for how this will look like, um, starting with the element function, which is one of the elements that we are elevating to being a more prominent entity element. So you can see that there are a lot of changes related to that. Um, and you will also see at the bottom that we are introducing an, a plural element called functions, which we are adapting from ESC CPF. Um, and this is highlighted in green because it is a completely new element to ED4. And then at the last point, we have currently two example files that we have created. The first one is a basic ED4 file, which includes all the mandatory elements with some test information, which isn't very much. Um, so that hasn't really changed from ED3 or ED2002. So it essentially kind of is the control section with some very specific administrative information and then the Archdesk element um, with at least uh, the now called identification data element, which was did um, and at least one sub element. 
And you can use that one to just do some hand coding to get a feeling for ED4 from scratch. So opening that in an XML editor and just kind of playing around a little bit to get an understanding of which elements are available, uh, what you can do with these elements, and how you can kind of include information that you want to include in there. And then the second one is an example that we have downloaded from the Library of Congress catalog uh, back in January when we started uh, preparing for this. Uh, it's an ED3 file, which we essentially have adapted manually to ED4. Um, so this is the option one that I explained earlier when working with the schema. Uh, so this file will include some comments in terms of the changes that have been done. Um, and um, not all of these changes uh, might be clear cut. So there are some of them that have to happen, while others might include suggestions in terms of um, alternative encodings for things that might not be represented in the same way anymore in ED4 as they were in ED3. And just to kind of give you an example for that and also mention the fact that if you do this um, from an ED2002 file, uh, you will have to keep in mind that these changes, of course, also affect all the elements that have already changed between ED2002 and ED3. So for example, the whole ED header to control thing is something that you would need to do, but it's not very specific to actually kind of getting to ED4. Um, but just sticking with this EAD3 example, um, one of the changes that we did is that we have moved the file desk element out of control to get control aligned with ECCPF. And you can see that this move has been commented as one of the changes. Um, some of the sub elements of um, file desk have been replaced by other elements um, that already existed in other contexts. So these have been commented out. Um, and there also are at uh, the bottom uh, in terms of the include, inclusion of the Mark 21 namespace suggestions in terms of alternative encodings. So this is what we currently have for you and how you can engage with it. Uh, but now the question of course is uh, once you have done that and have found maybe a bug or have found something that you want to suggest in terms of a feature, what do you do now? How do you submit the comment to the call for comments? And there are essentially kind of two formal options to do that and one informal option. Uh, the formal options we would recommend if you're really reporting a specific bug or feature request on a single element or group of elements, um, and that is submitting a comment either on GitHub, if you are registered there, or using our web form for this. And the informal option we would recommend for more general comments or questions that you might have on the new version, and that is just simply sending us your comment via email. If you do this via GitHub, uh, we would like to ask you to use our EES-schemas repository for this. So the link is here. And when you go there, you will see this new issue button, um, which leads you to a second page where you can confirm that you want to get started creating a new issue. Um, and we have essentially set up a template that already kind of gives you some um, predefined pointers and sections to fill in. Uh, the first thing is that you need to make sure to add a title because otherwise GitHub won't allow you to actually save the issue once you are done. Uh, and then we ask you to add your name if you want to, your organization, and some way to contact you. So if you are on GitHub, you can either include your GitHub username or an email address if you prefer that. Um, and this is mainly for us to follow up on you if we have any questions and or want any clarification in terms of what you are reporting. And then the second thing that we would ask you to do is to just kind of replace the white space between the brackets next to saying ED schema issue by an X. Uh, and that will, once you have saved that issue, kind of show up as a checked checkbox. So 
that's easier for us to kind of make sure that we are looking at your suggestion in the right context. And then in the lower part, this template includes different sections uh, where we have some indicators, so to say, in terms of information that we would ask you to provide depending on what type of issue you are creating. So if you are reporting a bug, then uh, we would want you to include information about what you find has been wrong or um, maybe also give us some information in terms of the context, how you found this bug. Um, if it is a feature request, we would want you to describe um, how you expect specific things to, to show or to, to be used uh, or to be defined. Um, so not all of these sections will apply to each and every comment. So if you think this is not working in your context, you can just leave them empty. Um, but these are just kind of some indicators in terms of uh, information that you might want to provide. The more precise or more detailed you can be, uh, the easier it will be for us at TSES to address your comment in the next steps. Um, and once you are content, you just click the Submit New Issue button, and we will then take it up in our usual processing. The same information you can enter via the web form that I already mentioned. So you will also find the, uh, the field for your name and your email address there. You will find a list where you can select the issue category of ED schema. And you find, will find kind of um, longer text fields where you include um, a description of your suggestion or your, the bug that you found and some more details in terms of a short statement um, and uh, information about what it is that you want to suggest. And then again, these sections that might or might not apply to the different contacts and at the end, the submit button. And the informal uh, way to connect to us, uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, is sending us a comment via email. As mentioned, we would prefer um, this to be the way used when you have general comments or questions or any type of, I just wanted to say X, Y, Z feedback. Um, while any specific feedback should go via one of the for two forms that I just mentioned. What happens once you have submitted your comments? Um, whichever you, way you have chosen to submit, uh, we will aim to let you know that we have received it, ideally within two weeks from you submitting your comment. Um, on GitHub, this will just look like um, us adding a simple comment on your issue directly to let you know the next steps. For submissions via the web form or email, uh, we will reply to you via email and just kind of let you know, thank you very much. Um, we'll take it to the next session. All comments will also be transformed into GitHub issues. Um, the main reason for that is that uh, GitHub is our central hub for all aspects around the revision and also our internal management tool. So once we have kind of um, received your, your comment, we will add things like um, making sure that the issue appears in the major revision project. Uh, we will assign a milestone to it. We might add labels to it that allow us to more easily find, for example, which part of EAD your comment refers to. And we will also uh, mention at which stage of the data processing we are. Um, all issues will start out as under review. And then depending on what the review brings, we will kind of go into the next steps. The first thing that we do is that the ED team of TSES will review and discuss all the comments that we receive um, during their monthly meetings, which are currently scheduled um, every last Friday of every month. Um, and once we have a decision, the GitHub issues will be be updated accordingly with that decision. And that might either be that we are saying we um, approve your suggestion and these are the next processing steps that we are going to take, 
Or it might be that we do not agree with your suggestion um, and maybe kind of provide you with an alternative solution. And again, for comments that were submitted via the web form or email, we might kind of give you that reasoning and feedback via email rather than on GitHub to keep everyone in the loop independent of the platform where you are connecting to us. This independence of platform will also apply to uh, a more general overview of the comments received. So we aim at um, giving a, an overview of the comments and their status in regular intervals, also in a non-GitHub-ish uh, context. Uh, and that will essentially be our page on the SAA website that I mentioned earlier. Um, so keep an eye on that uh, to see how the revision is going and how the call for comments is going. And with this, we are at the end of the presentation. And um, I've seen one note popping up in the chat or now two. Um, and I'm not sure if these are questions or general comments. So just having a look at that. So you have one question. One question: uh, Will there be a revision notes tracking changes compared to EAD two thousand and two? Yeah, thank you very much for that question, Louis. Um, yes, there will be, um, as we are acknowledging that a big part of the community is using EAD two thousand two. We also want to give that part of the community a chance to uh, more easily understand uh, what the new version might need mean for them. Um, so there will be uh, revision notes, respectively, the transformation routes uh, document um, for AD 2002 as well in probably the next month, one and a half months, depending on how much uh, time we can spend on this. And then we have a comment regarding uh, sharing information, uh, a tool that creates a visual representation of an XSD schema. So we will keep a track on that one and look at that one as well. Yeah, definitely. Thanks very much for sharing that, Louis. Um, and thanks also for your comment, Mike. Um, we might get back to your offer in terms of assistance. Um, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> We've now got a question from Elizabeth about the interoperability with uh, between EAD and BibFrame. Um, we have indeed looked at BibFrame uh, as part of our general comparison of ED with related standards. Um, it's not that obvious, so to say, in terms of the direct relation uh, at the moment, but we are um, still kind of looking for examples in terms of using ED and BibFrame. So if you have an example from your context, we would be happy to, to get that to also kind of um, have a closer look at uh, probably kind of uh, aligning that a little bit better if if necessary. Just giving it another minute or two to see if anyone is still typing a question. Otherwise, while you're Maybe thinking about oh, this one, maybe. Okay, yep. Perfect. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. That would be much appreciated. Yeah. So, if there are no other questions at the moment, um, I just wanted to 
end with uh, this information for you. So um, apart from this very introductory session uh, to the call for comments today, we are planning three more sessions uh, throughout the call for comments phase, uh, one on the 22nd of May, one on the 18th of June, and the last one on the 9th of July. Um, each of them will look at a specific part of EED4, so we will do a short introduction to that, uh, but then want to essentially kind of use those open sessions to really have more of an engaged uh, question and answers uh, sessions with the participants. Um, you can see from the times that are mentioned on the slides that we are trying to spread these sessions across different time zones to really make sure that um, everyone in the community around the world has the chance to at least attend one of those sessions uh, at a time that isn't in the middle of the night. Um, some of these sessions might work uh, also better for, for some um, parts of the world in terms of overlaps, uh, but all of these sessions will be recorded, um, so you will find them on the SA YouTube channel and we will inform accordingly about these being available. So even if you're not able to join the session directly, um, you will still be able to at least re-watch them. Um, and uh, thanks very much for your comment, Marcella. Um, I think that's also the feedback that we get and uh, which makes us um, want to do more of these engagement sessions. And I'm just going to stop sharing now to have a last check in if anyone has any questions. Um, otherwise, if that is not the case, we might just kind of end the session a few minutes earlier. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for your attention today. Uh, and we'll be looking forward to yeah, receiving your feedback uh, and discussing with you. And um, hopefully you will um, find a lot of new uh, and interesting and useful things in the new version of ED as we have prepared it. So thank you very much. And I wish everyone a good rest of your days, respectively, a good evening, depending on where you are. Thank you, Kirsten. You can stop the recording.